Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We are in the final stages of our trip through, of our quick trip through the Bible. And we're going to work on the book of James this time. And the, take your Bible, turn to James, and the first chapter, and verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Pretty heady instructions to get that and, completely filled out. Right, and how many people, if, if they didn't know about that verse, would have said that? I mean, you know, the theologians, they would have lots of other things they would want to add, and the, this almost sounds like an ethicist speaking, doesn't it? It does. And who was this James who chose to spoke with such um, conviction? Um, if there were such a thing as a general conference okay. in his day, mm -hmm. he would have been the GC president, would he not? Well, let's see if we can figure that out Let, before, <laughs> I, before I make a proclamation. Okay. Okay. This James is apparently the one. Now, there's, there's some assumptions here, so let's talk about them. When we come to Jude, he's going to talk about himself as James's brother. Uh, when Paul talks about James, he calls himself the brother of the Lord, calls this James the brother of the Lord. So if you put all those verses together, uh, there's reason to believe that this James was the brother of Jesus. Now we need to talk about what that is implied, what implies, is implied by that um, in a moment. Uh, probably the older brother of Jesus, although that's in some bit of disagreement on that subject. But uh, let's look at that. What do we know about any older brothers of Jesus? Well, that would have been one of those that was trying to shape him up and get him in line with the, with the uh, local politics. Exactly, exactly. And it's very interesting to, to look at this. Uh, look at Matthew 13, 55. Just let's go there for a moment. And I will, I will choose to go by my, um, my Good News Bible. That's my favorite translation. And Matthew 13, 55. As soon as my computer decides to get going here. Okay. Um, Shall I read it? Yeah, go ahead. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? Yeah. Who are those four again? Jesus, the carpenter's son brothers are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Okay, well the first thing you need to notice here that's very interesting is something about the name James. How many people can you think of in the New Testament who are named James? Quite a few. Well, we come up with the apostle, the disciple James. The disciple. Is and James, a, James really, is kind of an English name. Isn't really, it? Jacob, isn't it? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, that was that was our understanding already, right? Some Jacob. of you already have <laughs> talked up. about this. It turns out that there were nobody nobody in the New Testament or the Old Testament by the name of James, but for some reason the writers of the, I mean the translators, the English translators of the New Testament decided that there were too many Jacobs already in the Old Testament, so they just arbitrarily decided that all the Jacobs in the New Testament would be called James. And so all the Jameses in the New Testament are really Jacobs. So it's not hard to figure out why there were a lot of Jacobs in the New Testament. That's There's nobody in biblical times by the name of James. And wasn't it a little bit of 
more than maybe just a little bit of homage to the king, <laughs> King James, who had commissioned yeah. the translation mm -hmm. of the King James Version as we would know it. So, since we now don't have any James, uh, who is this non-James that we're talking about? Half-brother, <laughs> maybe a half-brother. Yeah. Okay, well, there's several possibilities. We won't might, not, might not even be a half-brother if he was older, would he? Well, let's look at some verses that, that would tell us a little bit about that. What about who this, this person might have been? Look at the book, the cha book of Acts, chapter 15, and start with verse 1. James the Greater. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. So you can see here's the traditional New Testament conflict. Here are the people who want to force Christians to be fully Jews before they can be Christians. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. Was, was there any conflict? Were there any conflicts in the New Testament churches? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. They were sent on their way by the church. As they went to Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God. Uh, this news brought great joy to all the believers. That when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders to whom they were uh, they told that God had done what God had done through them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, did you know that there were good Pharisees in the Christian, early Christian church, stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Well, if you follow down here, you'll find that different people made speeches. But finally, you get toward the end of the thing, um, Someone stood up and made a conclusion on behalf of everybody, verse 19. It is my opinion, James went on, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. And that was the end of the discussion. So, what position did James hold? The Chief. Sounds like he was sort of in charge, right? Well, it, it, it gets even more interesting because... We know that back in, and we don't have time to look at all these verses, back in the Gospel of John, it makes it clear that these brothers of Jesus came and tried to tell him what to do. Why don't you go up to Jerusalem, make yourself known? You think you're the Messiah? Even they, they, they took Mary with them, and she went along with them, trying to tell Jesus what to do. And Jesus said, you can go up whenever you want. You, nobody cares about whether you're up there. I will go up when the time is right. And you know what happened. But... Um, and, and so they were, they were opposed to Jesus through pretty much all their lives until what? After he died in the resurrection when, the, when James saw him. And when did that happen? Um, well, the James that saw him, was that, his, was that the brother of Jesus or was that the disciple James? The disciple. The, the lesser. Which one is lesser and greater? I just want to make sure. Well, there's the great, greater, greater is the, yeah, okay, the one the born before. Well, look at Acts 1, starting with verse 12. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a kilometer away from the city. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Patriot, Judas, son of James. Okay, there's the usual list, minus Judas, of course, Iscariot. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And from there on, the brothers of Jesus seem to be in cahoots with the disciples. Well, if I saw my brother riot raised from the dead, I think I would be too. <laughs> cahoots has a kind of a bad connotation. I yeah, see. They, so. uh, they became believers. They became believers. Yeah. Well, who were, th who were these brothers? The next question that comes about them is, were they real brothers, full brothers of Jesus? Legend has it that Mary never ever had any other kids. Well, but we need more authority than legend. <laughs> Matthew 125. What well, is that makes Joseph it did not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus. But okay, but that, that doesn't mean he couldn't have had children afterwards. I understand, but at least that's a starting point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they wouldn't have been older. They would not have been older. A little chronology. No. <laughs> they would not have been older. Uh, it, to, they would not be an older full brother. No. Right. They're not brothers mm -hmm. at all. So, okay, all that suggested. What? What? It, okay, yes. I, I had a quick question about Acts chapter 1, verse 
uh, 13, where it says, James, son of Alphaeus. Yeah. Which Alphaeus is that? That's, that James is one of the disciples. Okay. Right. There was James and John, so there's a James, the son of Alphaeus, and then there's this other one that we're asking about. Lots of Jameses. Mm -hmm. Who and are then, really Jacobs. And then just to throw another question out there, uh, it mentioned uh, Judas over there, but that was not Judas of Iscariot. No. That was another Judas Different who was Judas. Jesus' brother. Well, and of course, they shouldn't be surprised because the Judas is the Greek version of Hebrew Judah. Right. So, Which of course. Which would be a very common name. Yes. So, that Judas, there was another Judas brought in as a disciple after, after the Judas of Iscariot. No. No. Uh, the one who joined them was Matthias. Matthias, right. There what was there, there, there two Judases in the, the discipleship in, among yes. the twelve. Okay, now one of those would one of those be Jesus' brother also? No evidence for that. Okay, because earlier it said one of his brothers' names was Judas. We'll get to that eventually. All right. Um, let's leave that question for a little. Right. We're on James right now. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, there's three possibilities about this James and who he was. That, that, these were, that he was an actual brother of Jesus, a son of both Joseph and Mary, therefore younger than Jesus. Mm. Now, against that is the idea that when Mary comes to the cross at the death of Jesus, Jesus says to John, John, behold your mother, mother, here's your son, suggesting that John should be taking care of Mary he would not have said that in, in the Jewish tradition if she had other children who were supposed to care for her. So that's a strong opposition to that idea. So it looked like Mary had no other sons by... Um, by anybody. Okay, by anybody. Okay. Yep. A, a second possibility, these were his stepbrothers, that is, the children of Joseph by a previous marriage, and thus all older than Jesus, and not his blood relatives at all. You see, now, if they were children of Joseph by a previous marriage, how would they be related to Jesus? Just Through bloodlines. Just by name. Noth nothing more than living in the same house. Stepbrothers. Stepbrothers. Okay. And some have suggested that they were cousins of Jesus on his mother's side, according to some, or on Joseph's side, according to others. And, and those two views are really just speculative. It wouldn't say brother if they were cousins. Well, but in the Bible you'll find that oh. some of those terms are used a little bit more loosely than what we're accustomed to. Okay. Now the interesting thing about it, if you go back to Matthew uh, 13, you'll notice something interesting there. Matthew 13, you remember that verse? What did you find there? What verse? Uh, 55 again, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? And reading on verse 56, aren't all his sisters living here? Where did he get all this? So if the odds are normal, there would be four girls along with four boys. In other words, Jesus had eight older siblings, if in fact these are stepbrothers. He at least had two sisters because there's an S. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Well, Joseph was considerably older than Mary. Yes. So it's very possible. So it turns out, if he's got eight children already, yeah. the oldest child, and when he married, there's pretty good evidence that when he married Mary, she was probably not more than a teenager. So the oldest son, who may have been James, wasn't much younger than Mary herself. Could have been older, even. Could have been older. Probably not, but could have been. So, interesting... Uh, situation. So Jesus came up in a blended family? Yes. Why would God choose to do it that way? Perhaps for uh, many of the folks I know in our country, uh, we're at the 50% plus rate mm -hmm. of uh, blended families and, and uh, what we would call, I'm not saying this about Jesus' family, but in our <laughs> society, we have many dysfunctional families and many families of uh, mixed parenting in the form of, you know, divorce like that, so, and, yeah. and abandonment. So this really could be quite comforting for many people today if they really understood the full ramifications of yeah. that. 
Okay. Couple that with his with his other parentage farther back is but mm. exactly really, uh, yeah. and in fact it came the through in his mother line. Of Jesus, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, his, his family line wasn't that pure. <laughs> well, you go to Rahab and uh, Rahab Boaz the prostitute, and, and so forth. Yeah, Rahab, and not only that, a what about Bathsheba? A Moabitess. Moabitess, Ruth, and what about Tamar? Yeah. Are you saying that David our family? The murderer and our families. God's have, priorities are a little bit different than our. He's very kind to us. Yes. Really. Jesus' family looks as 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 assorted as our families. A little well, bit. Like that. We call it sorted. Maybe it maybe sorted. doesn't bother God all that much. Well, well, isn't that family a little different since they had a virgin birth and it's. I mean. Is that the way you else? purify the family line by having a virgin birth? No, you do that. <laughs> You do that. I, I'm, I fully understand why it would have to be that way because you can't explain it now. Well, the interesting thing is this. If you go back and look at the stories of those very interesting women that are mentioned in Matthew 1, those stories are just sort of tucked in the Bible in places where they don't, they wouldn't need to be there at all. God intentionally tells their stories for some reason. There's reasons. Not for filler. Not for filler. And then Jesus comes along and says, oh, by the way, did you know that she was a descendant of, I mean, an ancestor of mine, and she was, and so was she, and so was she, and very interesting. Well, so the best evidence from Scripture is that James and his four brothers and however many sisters were actually older siblings of Jesus. And if you want to see the evidence for that and dig into it in more detail, you can look up in any one of a number of uh, commentaries. Or you can look at our website, that's Theological Crossroads, or Theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. Um, and you can find it on the web. And in there you look under the handout, which we'll be working our way through on the book of James. Well, it turns out that um, this is one of the books that Luther had a real problem with. Now Luther said, and oh, I should say that just to complete the history of James a little bit, there's two things that are that are very interesting about James. Josephus, later things. Josephus said he was stoned to death at the end of his life. If you accept Josephus as an authority, he's probably pretty good. Uh, and secondly, in the last four or five years, there's been a lot of conflict in the public media, if you've been paying any attention, about a little alabaster box about this size that... Uh, was called a bone box because in the Jewish traditions around about the time of Jesus, they would have a cave, a family cave, people would be buried there, and then when, after, after the bodies had deteriorated, they would carefully gather the bones together and put them together in a special way in this little bone box and set it aside so the next person in the family who dies could, could sleep on the, on the bench in the cave where, where people were supposed to be buried, just as Jesus was buried on a bench in a cave. Um, so, and that bone box that has been in the moon news is labeled on the side of it, it says James, son of Jacob, brother of, uh, I mean, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Mm. And there's every reason to believe that that's authentic. Mm. Wait, so we, James? We, huh? James? Yes. Well, I didn't say James, no, but I mean, it's this one. It says Jacob. It would say Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after you die, how long does it take before you're, you Completely turn? Deteriorated? Be, yeah, so that they can put you in a bone box. Does that if take you're one a, year? If you're in a depends warm, on the temperature. Yeah, it depends on the temperature. If you're in a warm climate and no preservatives of any kind, it doesn't, it doesn't take very long. As, as in month, year, two years? You want to comment about that? <laughs> I'd, put it, I'd put it in a year. Somewhere. Yeah, six somewhere months to a year. Yeah. And that's in a warm climate? Yeah. And what happens if somebody needs to use it? Use well, they would they would move them off, maybe off of the floor or something. Yeah. Mm. And what was the issue with um, once someone died about cremation? I know the, but sometimes didn't they throw the bodies on the fire outside of the walls? Well, that of the was city? people who were completely they were rejected. Poor. Well, that means if if you have nobody to do anything with you at all when you die, no family who cares about you, nobody who cares about you at all, then you get thrown on the trash heap. Oh, well, yeah. we have that today. Every two years they get all the bodies that no one, if the science uh, doesn't need them, they burn them in a group. Hmm. Wow. They do that today. 
Okay. Well, anyway, let's move on now into... But God can still find you in that trash, mm -hmm. in that heap, and resurrect you. Yes. So, even if we get thrown there, we can be resurrected. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, um, say a couple more things about James. The book of James, well, before we go to the book, well, let's talk about the book of James. Now, um, the Message Bible has some, always some very colorful things to say about each book in the Bible. I'm going to read uh, the little introduction from the Message Bible. When Christian believers gather in churches, everything that can go wrong sooner or later does. Outsiders on observing this conclude that there is nothing to the legal, nothing to the religion business except perhaps business and dishonest business at that. Insiders see it differently. Just as a hospital collects the sick under one roof and labels them as such, the church collects sinners. Many of the people outside the hospital are every bit as sick as the ones inside, but their illnesses are either undiagnosed or, undiagnosed or disguised. It's similar with sinners outside the church. So Christian churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behavior. They are, rather, places where human misbehavior is brought out in the open, faced, and dealt with, assuming the church is not dysfunctional. The letter of James shows one of the church's early pastors skillfully going about his work of confronting, diagnosing, and dealing with areas of misbelief and misbehavior that have turned up in congregations committed to his care. Deep and living wisdom is on display here, wisdom both rare and essential. Wisdom is not primarily knowing the truth, although it certainly includes that. It is skill in living. For what good is a truth if we don't know how to live it? What good is an intention if we can't sustain it? According to church traditions, James carried the nickname Old Camel Knees because of the thick calluses built up on his knees from many years of determined prayer. I, I, I've looked up to see where that would be found, documented, but it's interesting. The prayer is foundational to the wisdom. Prayer is always foundational to wisdom. Well, for those of you who know something about the study of the book of James, you know that one of the first questions that comes out up about James was the fact that Luther rejected this book completely. He said, and I quote, and, and this is quoted from Luther's preface to the New Testament in the 1546 edition, and the original came out actually in 1522. In a word, St. John's Gospel, he, he, now he's talking about the, the books of the New Testament that are acceptable in his, in his version. In a word, St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and salvatory for you to know, even if you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. Okay? Therefore, St. James's epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to these others. For it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it, but more of this in other prefaces and, and so forth. So those were Luther's words about the book of James. What Do you agree? What does it mean, an epistle of straw? It means it can be tossed on the fire and burned. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. Is, was this early or late in his career? Um, early. Fairly early. Because I think he got past it later on, didn't he? Um... I don't know about that evidence. But well, what he, points did he not like about that? There point? wasn't nearly enough about salvation by faith alone. Well, first of all, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'd like to say that the epistle begins with James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. That's a pretty good start. Yeah. You he wouldn't have any problem with that part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting that he would, James would say that since he was an older brother to Jesus. He certainly wouldn't have said that in his earlier days. So, um, righteousness by faith, um, righteousness by works. Um, does well, while pa Paul's main emphasis was faith, obviously, James' main emphasis seems to be action. You know your faith by your actions? Is yes. that James? That's James. Righteousness by faith, but that faith shows itself through the actions, not righteousness no. by actions. No. What it would, James would say, faith works. Okay, faith accomplishes works. Faith works, okay? Well, faith shows itself by mm -hmm. works. Faith is an action word. Faith is a noun. In that thing, works is a verb. Mm -hmm. Faith 
works. Yes. Uh, well, well, not necessarily. In the Bible, works is a noun sometimes. Well, yeah, but in this sentence in this that this I just sentence. used, I'm saying faith, and the verb is works. It works. It accomplishes what needs to happen. Okay. okay. Well, you know, James really lived that out because when he saw his brother in that he was God, Mm -hmm. And he became, he did yeah. get faith, and he started to work for Jesus. Yeah. So he was the epitome of what he wrote about. Now, this letter, if we call it a letter from James, and remember his real name was Jacob once again, isn't really a letter, only in this most superficial way by the introduction. It's a, it's a treatise. It's a, it's a document for churches to look at, and a dissertation, a sort, yeah. Um, but it's emphasizing, as we know, Actions. He said, I want you church members to behave in the following ways. So it's not specifically for one church. He wrote it no. for the um, go guideline back and, for Go Paul. back and look at the introduction. Someone was just reading the introduction. What does it say? James. Greetings, Greetings to, to the all. 12 tribes. Yes. Greetings to the 12 tribes. Scattered over the whole world. Okay. So what does that tell you? Who's he addressing himself to? Every Christian. The is, 12 tribes? Is... Twelve tribes, so that's which Israelites. tribe do you belong to? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you only which tribe do you belong to? Well, I think Paul would probably is pick this, it out for you, wouldn't he? Is this the twelve mm -hmm. spiritual tribes? No, this book was written very early in the history of the Christian church. Some people, a number of people, a number of scholars would say this is, may have been the very first book. It may even have been earlier than First and Second Thessalonians, which were the first books written by Paul. But there weren't even 12 tribes in, uh, of the Jews left, right? No. So he was saying, theoretically, this is we, for everybody. Yes, oh. that's a possibility. But uh, people in Paul's and James's day probably would have said, this is for every Jew. Oh. This is for every Jew. Do they mean Christian Jew or Jew? Well, in that case, in this case, yes, it would be Christian Jew. Yes. So that disturbed some people. Well, how early is this book? Is it even earlier before Peter's uh, thing with the the um, sheet of... Oh, no, 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 not before that. It's not before that. No. Yeah. But it may be before Acts 15, the council recorded Probably in Acts 15. Probably before Acts 15, which was in AD 49. Well, how does God give wisdom? Through prayer. Look at James 1, verse 5. What does, what does that tell you? You to ask God for wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, you should pray to God. He will give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all. So all you dumb people, what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but who gives it generously to all without finding fault. Yes. So filled up with fault, but just ask and then receive. What else do you need? I think so, when... But, so the the next, you, but the next sentence starts with a but. <laughs> it's, always one. it's got something yeah. more to it. <laughs> okay. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Exactly. Well, what is that man? What's the sorry, definition of the next what's, one after that then is important well, for the well, readers what, at home. What is the Go definition ahead. of faith of, of wisdom? You're going to have to take a break right now, so hold oh. your questions. We'll go back. Come back to them.
We finished our first half of today's discussion by talking about how you get wisdom. I hope you all got that straight. James 1, 5 just says you have to ask for it. Uh, does that really work? Well, I still don't know what the definition of wisdom is. Because, do, okay, if living. I go down... Skill in living. I'll give you the answer. Skill in living. Yes. Okay, well, that can mean a lot of things. But what if I wanted to be a brain surgeon? Do I get on my knees and ask God, say, no. God, no. please make me a no. brain wisdom surgeon? Wisdom or is it smart? That's, well, that's my, my question. What is the definition well, you know, of wisdom? I do that because I'm a very foolish person. And I, when faced with a problem or a situation I can't figure out because most of my family's gone, there's no one to lean on, and I say, God, you're the creator. You had a lot of good, eyes, good ideas in creating this uh, earth. Give me an idea. What, what, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And you know, pretty soon, bing, I'll get a little idea. And um, I can't say that it's uh, bad. It, it works. I hope you don't think that's foolish. I don't. I, I just say thank you. Thank you. This morning I had a gentleman come into my office, see me as a patient. He's been a patient of mine. We thought he was about dead, I don't know, 15 years ago. And he came in today and he was in pretty good shape. He's, he's, he must be into his 80s somewhere. I don't know exactly how old he is. But um, he came to see me and he comes in and he, he, he will not leave until I pray for him. <laughs> he, you know, he says, you, you know, and I start, I didn't do that way back at the beginning. And then I started praying for him and he, he, sometimes I think he comes in just so I'll pray for him. And I mean, the guy is someone who should have been dead 15 years ago is still doing just fine walking around. Something's working. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's reinforcing his faith. Yeah. Uh -huh. So is that wisdom? I'm just saying that we're, we're not, we're not, we're, we're including that in wisdom. Yes. So Let's flip it around the other way. You pray, and then whatever you get is wisdom. Hmm? Okay. Why did you have no I love that. That was good. Okay. We, we need to move on because we've got a lot of book to cover. Look down at verse 13. First, uh, James, I'm sorry, 1 and verse 13. I'm going to read on from there. There's some very interesting verses there. Happy are those who remain faithful under trials. Because when they succeed in passing such a test, they will receive as a reward the life which God has promised to those who love Him. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, now what would you expect someone to say if they were tempted? The devil made me do it. Yeah, something like that. This temptation, the Bible says, this temptation comes from God. How many of us are tempted by God? For, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself tempts no one. But people are tempted, now we know who it's going to talk about, right? When they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, what's the source of most of our temptations? Our own evil desires. Our own evil desires, oh dear. Now we got One a problem. One word, selfishness. Yes. The way you were born. Yeah. So what what could happen in the life of a Christian that would get the devil really excited? They would want to satisfy every evil desire. Just mm -hmm. do it. Well, that might make the de devil happy, but he would probably go on celebrating on his in the beach front villa on the Riviera because he's doing his own thing. So what was your question? Did what I would get him really excited? You didn't say whether it'd be happy, excited. No, I, that, I was still believing that's sort of up to you. The devil gets really excited if he finds people turning back to God. And he's got to get off, get off his vacation and get back to work. See, I would say distress. That in, Luke, in Luke 15, it says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. Do you suppose that's true the other way around? More than likely. More than likely. I don't think the devil is ever on vacation. You don't think he's ever on vacation? No, I don't think so. I, he's always busy. So when you start to be tempted and you are tempted and you, you go have a whoopsie and you sin, uh, Satan and his uh, demons are cheering? Sounds like it. So. Uh, 
Okay, so l l let's, let's, again, looking at some more things, I want you to keep moving. Was Paul, were Paul and James really in contradiction to each other? Well, look at a couple of verses. Look at Romans 2, verse 13. Paul saying, by grace, and James saying, by work. faith works. Uh, Paul saying, by faith, and James saying, by faith works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Romans 2, 13, listen carefully. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. That's Paul. Romans 2.13. Sounds a lot like James. James 1 verse 20 says, Do not deceive yourselves by just listening to his word. Instead, put it into practice. Is there any difference between those two verses? Mm -mm. No. They're almost identical, aren't they? So where's the contradiction? The contradiction is only in the emphasis. James says, and, and James, let's, let's be honest now, James was written before anything from Paul. Okay? And James says, let's talk about what really matters. What really matters is that your faith makes a difference. I'm not interested in faith that doesn't make a difference in your life. I want to see a change in your life. Okay? Well, you know, the demons listened to uh, Jesus also, and uh, mm -hmm. they believed Jesus was the Son of God, and, but their lives do not uh, reflect... Um, the, the issue here is, and where we get into big discussions about it, is if we think that James is saying that you earn some salvation by the works he's talking about, and he's not. Or, or possibly skip the faith and go straight to the works. That's right. So, I mean, as long as these works are the result of the faith, and not an effort to earn salvation, yeah. then they're fine. If we, and if, if in our discussions of them, we take an assumption that their works is a way of getting your salvation, then we're off on the wrong foot to begin with. Right. Moving down a few more verses. There's, a couple, there's some very interesting ones here. How do you understand James 1.25? But those who look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, a law that sets people free, or the King James says, perfect law of liberty, who keep on paying attention to it and do not simply listen and then forget it, but put it into practice, they will be blessed by God in what they do. How could a law set people free? I thought laws sort of bind up your freedom. Here it says, uh, you're set free from sin. And if you're set free from sin, you don't have to worry about going to jail, Mm -hmm. uh, getting some diseases and other things, so it does liberate you. Well, if you are in harmony with the law, you don't perceive it as constraining. Mm -hmm. It just comes out naturally. The problem is you can't tell when you see somebody doing a good work. You can't tell what motive is behind it. Mm -hmm. So don't we can't. we can't. So d we better not project. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see somebody going down the road 55 miles an hour, and there's a black and white car right behind them. Do you know for sure why that guy is going? He always drives miles like that, doesn't he? Well, you could say <laughs> he's seen he's seen the 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 black and white, and, and he's scared, and that's why he's doing it. Or you could say he doesn't even know the black car is there, and he just thinks this is the safe speed to drive. Yeah. And you can't tell by looking. You have to be God to look into the heart and you know. Do you think, though, that um, all freedom has its restrictions? Sure. I mean, if you had freedom you without restrictions, you'd have chaos. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only, you're the, only, is, the, only, the only difference is that everybody should agree on the restrictions. Yeah. I think, they, I think that's the point. When you start imposing restrictions on people, well, then your freedom goes out the window. Okay, look at, look at another couple of verses. Drop down a few more verses. Go to chapter 2, verse 10. We're going to read 10 through 12. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. Does that sound fair? For the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. Now that part, that makes sense. Speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that sets us free. There's that law that sets us free again. 
How, how, many, how many ways do you have to break a vase? You can throw a rock at it, you can drop it, you can do all, but no matter what you do, you still break the base. I mean, if, if you break the law, you're breaking love. Mm -hmm. And so if love's getting broke, there you go. Um, how, do you, how do you suppose those verses fit with Jesus' own words in, in, in John 8? You want to look over there? John 8, I'm going to start reading from verse 31. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, If you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Is that related to the law that sets you free? Same difference. God's law is truth. So you feel, you feel very liberated to live under the Ten Commandments. It's we don't because we're sinful humans. But we should. It's truth as far as understanding God's character. I feel safe. I feel comfortable living under the Ten Commandments. And I wish everyone would because then we wouldn't have to worry about someone killing us, a lot of money stealing from us, cheating on us with our family or, or any of these other things. Do away with the police force yeah. if we followed rather, the commandments. I would just rather be doing it and automatically doing the Ten Commandments. Not looking at the Ten Commandments all yeah, the time, making sure. sure that I'm doing everything right. Yeah. Well, we don't really have to look at it because it's very simple. You know, don't kill anybody. So we don't. You know, once well, we know that, we never have to look fine, at it again. That's fine, but as long as I have to have a a plate up there or something to look at, yeah. and make sure every day that oh, did I do this right? What what score would they give me on this one and all that? And then that that may crazy. go back though to James. <clears throat> where we were just at in chapter 2, the very next verse in um, after 12. Mm -hmm. That would see. be 13. Well, part of 12 also, after speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, mm -hmm. because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So this is, you know, a lot of people think that Paul, uh, James, Jacob, Jacob, is he's the hard guy in here. But he just, he just pointed out, mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah. Sounds like he's a softy. Well, the founder of the SDA church, uh, which most of us belong to, um, said back in about 1890, these following words, but in heaven service is not rendered in the spirit of legality, when Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, this would be back before this earth was created, before this world was created, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. That's pretty striking, isn't it? And then later, she said in 1900, this infinite standard, this talking about the law, this infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. That's Christ's Obstacle page 315. That God can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. So, one of the things that sets, uh, really sort of lights up the book of James and raises lots of interesting discussion is, is chapter 3. Look, um, look at chapter 3. Oh, the untamable tongue. The untamable tongue. What is an untamable tongue? No, we have it. <laughs> <laughs> you claim special, the special, uh, to be special <coughs> owner of one. Is that yep, right? Yep, 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 yep. Now, of course, this is symbolism. We know that the tongue doesn't do anything by itself, does it? It's a, it represents. It spits out what the brain tells it to do. So, we're really, talking about the brain here, aren't we? Oh, look at this. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that as such we will incur stricter judgment. So if you're a teacher of the Bible, you're going to be under stricter judgment? Because you're, if you're a teacher, you're supposed to be an example of what you teach. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And he goes on to talk about how you can turn a ship around with a really, fairly small a rudder. You can start a forest fire with a very small flame and so forth. He says, watch out for that tongue. It's a dangerous member. Did you read verse 8? Go ahead. 
But the tongue can no man tame. Yeah. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. He talks about putting bits in horses' mouths and how you can control them. The powerful horse with, the, with a fairly small bit. And we bless our Lord and Father, and with the same tongue we curse men. Uh, and That's like saying, a great way to go. Uh, verse, verse 10 there. Chapter does a fountain two. send out the same opening, both fresh and bitter water? Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. um, one of the things that's very interesting, James, look at James 2.19. Um, let me get down. You there. believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now, I thought that the word belief and faith and trust and confidence were all the same word in the Bible. Is that the same word we're looking at there? Looks like it. Yeah, but it doesn't have the corresponding works. Does it? Well, who does says it, about does works? The devil, does the devil have the corresponding works? If he, had, he may have no. the faith, which shows he doesn't have the faith, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say whatever you want. It does come down to actions. Okay. But in, but in faith. Well, let, 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 let me read the full paragraph on that. That's a really interesting section. James 2, I'm start from, starting from verse 18. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. So guess who that puts you with? <laughs> you fool, what, do you want to be shown that faith without, without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see? And of course, every Jew would look up to Abraham as what? The father of the faithful, right? But look what he goes on to do. And the scriptures came true that said Abraham believed God and because of his faith God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then that it is by people's actions they are put right with God and not by their faith alone. And then he does something really radical. It was the same with a prostitute Rahab. Now how in the world can you put the saint Abraham in the same basket with a prostitute Rahab? Because their faith made him function. She had faith, and she did something um, that the, if she did she not did have... She did a very good job of lying and protecting yeah, his if, wife's Well, life. But if she <laughs> didn't have faith, she never would have done what she did. True. Well, she knew, she knew what was going to happen. I mean, she, she had was, faith as to what was going to happen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. This um, action thing kind of reminds me of that story about Jesus when he was talking about two brothers responding to their father. Their father wanted them to do something. And the one brother said, yes, yes, sir. Right on it, dad. Mm -hmm. And the other brother said, no, I'm not going to do that. And then the one that said, yes, sir, I'm going to do that. He didn't do it, but the, but the disobedient one fulfilled the actions that the father wanted. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, which was the good one? Yeah. Well, the one keep, who did it. I keep imagining myself sometime being sitting on a corner somewhere starving to death and some Christian comes up and says, man, I really feel sorry for you. I'll pray for you and walks off. <laughs> so there's, there's a belief there, but there's no action. Mm -hmm. And that action would have been really welcomed. Yes. Here's a job. What if the, what if the Christian that just says he'll pray for you is as poor as you are? Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said that he had, he had the ability to do something. Well, I didn't hear that part. I'm well, <laughs> okay, you can change that if you want. Well, then. There's, a, there's a very interesting verse about sin here in this little book of James. It's found in chapter 4, verse 17. So then, I'm reading again from my Good News Bible. So then, those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. Now, that's your point, right? Mm -hmm. Those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. Is that the sin of omission rather than the sin of commission? Yes, the sin of omission. You leave it out. You omit it. Okay. So in the, in the uh, United States judicial system, 
if you see a crime happening, you have no obligation to stop that crime. Seems like it's a little bit of a different law here. Mm -hmm. If we have the ability to prevent something, if we see something terribly horrible happening to someone, and we have the ability to stop it, we should stop it or say something, try to prevent it from going on, it seems to me. Not all crimes. Some yes, some no. Because as a teacher, if you see something with your children, you ask to report it. It depends on the crime. And also, we were talking about different factors <laughs> of wisdom. Wisdom enable you to decipher things. Uh, someone with true wisdom, you can decipher what's wrong and what's not right. Also, even Paul mentioned uh, regarding the commandments. The commandments does bring about, do bring out about freedom because it makes you, once you know what's right and it becomes habitual, you just do it because it's right. There's, there's a good feeling in that. Mm -hmm. And right. knowing that the person next to you feels or does the same, it's, 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 it is free. Yes. And, the, and the reporting of it was actually one of the aspects that I was alluding to, mm -hmm. uh, where we're not required by law to report something. There so people kind of just disappear, and then the police never know what really happened or who the guilty party was. So reporting no. it is, is an action. I would like to uh, look, look, there are two other verses in the Bible which, talk, which try to define sin. What about these? First John 3, 4. I'll now read from my Good News Bible again. Whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law. That's very close to the King James, which, by the way, is a very liberal translation. That last part just says literally, sin is lawlessness. And many modern versions have that. So that's another definition. Sin is lawlessness. There's another definition found in Romans 14, 23. But he who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not act from faith for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. How does that fit with, let's say, John James 4, 7 to 17? You have that's to come up with an define. example. Yeah. You have to come up with an example to really understand yeah. that one. Well, and if you can go back to the Old Testament, you'll find Isaiah 59, 2 that says, It is because of your sins that he, he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And then earlier, um, we were talking about in James, anyone who breaks one commandment breaks all of them. Mm -hmm. Well, in one of the Gospels, Jesus was saying, even if you thought it, you've done it. And actually, you know, that sounds really hard, but actually it's a blessing for us because what he's saying there is that we're all equal, we're all guilty, we all need the Savior, we all need Jesus to save us, and um, you know we can't do it without Jesus. Yeah. So even if you thought it, you're guilty, and if you're guilty of that one, you're guilty of all of them, you're hopeless, you're lost, mm -hmm. unless you have a Savior that can come and, yeah. and redeem you. What kind over, of logic do you use to say if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of them all? Well, over Christmas, I had a uh, relative ask me, are gay people going to go to hell and, uh, because they're sinning? And I said, you know, Jesus didn't list the sins from top to bottom. This was a bad sin, this was a lesser sin, and this was a little teeny tiny sin. He said, if you sin, no matter what, it's just the same. So it's not like there, uh, some people think some sins are worse than others, but didn't Jesus say that when you sin, you sin? But here in James, it does make some sins that are more serious than others. It does? Yes. Oh dear. Well, I didn't tell him right. Let's go to and it. In, in several. But, well, I, I we, that because the, the problem is that they're all rebellion. Yeah. And rebellion is the thing that ties them all yes. together. Well, um, we, we can't leave the book of James without saying a little thing about riches. Right through the book of James in several places, he, he decries the rich. He says, the rich are the ones who put us down. They're the ones who, who, who sometimes we have to work for them and they don't pay us right. There's all kinds of problems with these rich people. Why is it that when one of those rich people shows up at church, and says, oh, have a nice seat right over here and say to the poor man, sit there on the floor. You, that's good enough for you. 
They have a building program. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're looking for someone to help them out, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, some modern sage said, uh, talking about money, money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place. Is that true? Or what about 1 Timothy 6.10? For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it. Now, would that be people who are rich or people who are not rich? Well, Could be either one, right? It, yeah. <laughs> Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. Pretty, pretty, pretty bad state of affairs, right? Well... James ends up by saying some interesting things about prayer. James 5, 13 to 18. We don't have time to read it there. But he talks about praying for the sick. Does, does that actually heal people? He says, the effectual, in the King James, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does that mean? Well, that man came to you for healing or for yes. a prayer, and it seemed to affect much because he's still kicking around at 85. Yeah, he believes. He believes in yes. what he believes. That's why everything is is the belief. That's his faith. Yes, he believes. Well, it's interesting to look back and realize that if you look at the story of Jesus, he spent more time healing than he did preaching. And our founder Ellen White of this church said that we should never separate healing and teaching. They should always go together. Why would that be? Any idea? First, you need to get the person well and sane before he can understand what you're trying to teach. If he's suffering from a lot of pain, whatever, or he's dysfunctional for whatever reason, it may be hard for him to focus on what you have to say. That's why we have the school lunch program at school, or the breakfast program, so the kids can have a full tummy before they go to class. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so in the book of James, we have seen a person who was one of the early church leaders, among Jews particularly, as opposed to Paul, who's a leader among Gentiles. And he goes through and he talks about a lot of the problems, a lot of the sins that are very common in churches, and he says, these are the things that we should do about those, and we should read James pretty carefully. He has some good ideas. See you next week.